So before I begin, uh, as I kind of hinted at last time, this is a weird episode to talk about. I do still enjoy this episode, but it would be more accurate to say I enjoy about 11 minutes of this episode. Uh, the last 11 minutes. Actually, it's probably closer to the last 9 minutes. Uh, or the 9 minutes preceding and then the 2 minutes... Let me start over. There's a guy in this episode who really helps sell it. I, I want to show you a picture of him. I'm going to show it right over here, okay? So, this gentleman over here... Um, I don't know if you recognize him, because I sure as hell didn't when I first saw him. Uh, that is Phil Morris. He's actually a long-standing Star Trek veteran. He's been in a lot of other stuff, too. Uh, you may or may not recognize that picture. That's actually him playing one of the kids in the episode Miri, all the way back in the original series. Uh, he's done a couple of other bits as well, uh, including in Star Trek Three, and he was in a Deep Space Nine episode as a Jem Hadar. He was also as a Klingon somewhere. I believe that was also a Deep Space Nine episode. So he's kind of a long-term uh, extra Star Trek vet, but don't mistake that as an insult. He's a he, he pretty much sells this episode for me. The reason why... <sighs> so, every now and again, I feel like I wish I could go into the writer's room, especially of Voyager, but of shows in general, and just start, like... I don't literally want to hurt anybody. That's not my interest. But I, I feel like I just want to strangle them until they see sense. But of course, that's not how that's going to work. Because if I strangle them, they'll lose oxygen and then they'll see less sense. So that's not what I want to do. What I want to do is I want to hit them with pillows. Okay, that doesn't sound quite as intimidating. But the point is, it's so nonsensical! What happened was they had this whole episode written that was going to be a Chakotay-centric episode. Robert Beltran was really happy about this. He had been quietly pushing behind the scenes saying, guys, my character is being crapped on. I don't have jack to do. I feel like an extra on a show in which I'm technically second billing. Please give me an episode. And they said, you got it, Robert. We'll go ahead and get you this episode. And they threw together this whole episode. In my completely blunt opinion, that would have been a great episode to watch. As is, it's about half of an episode I have to endure, and then half of a great episode. The... <sighs> so it should be obvious what happened. What happened was someone... I'm not saying it was Rick Berman, because I don't know if it was. This does match... You know, these fingerprints of what happened here do match his overall style of meddling. But, you know. Someone said, well, nobody likes Chakotay as a character. So why don't you focus on a popular character instead? Now, this, call me weird. Let me just blow your mind here with a little bit of know-how and savvy. If you have an unpopular character, you have three options with how to deal with them, Okay. When I say unpopular, what I mean is non-popular. The audience didn't hate Chakotay, they just didn't care about him. Uh, this is actually kind of the same reaction we had with Harry Kim. In fact, I've talked about that before. So, three options, right? The first option, just whatever, let it ride. Let the actor do whatever. I'm sure that it'll be fine. And if they complain, oh well, we can always replace them. Kill them off because of a sludge monster or an oil slick or something like that. It'll be easy. Um... <clears throat> Second option, uh, actively get rid of them. Just g eject them from the show. Kill off Chicote. Kill off Harry. Third option, sit down and try to actually do some with th something with the character so that the audience actually gives a crap about him or her. Obviously, I say him in this case because I'm referring to Chicote and, to an extent, to Harry Kim. But, you know, those are your options, right? <sighs> so, naturally, they went with option one. Eh, nobody cares about Chakotay. So, you can really see how this episode was a Chakotay episode. And then you can see how blatant the changes are. This is literally another episode wearing the skin... I'm saying this wrong. This is an episode wearing the skin of another episode. The core, the core elements of this episode... Uh, you can see through the cracks of the of the rotting, tattered flesh of what it was supposed to be about, about Chakotay, about exploration, about reaching out to the stars, the general impetus and idea of being Voyager in general, and that appealing to the crew and human nature, blah, blah, blah. You can see that under there, and you can see how that would apply to Chakotay as well in the way they structured the episode. 
and then kind of graft it on. I, my, my earlier analogy is actually a bad analogy. This is like some, they took the core episode idea, which is the underneath part, and then they took chunks of something else and just stapled it on. Like imagine if you have a cow and someone just grabs some tufts of cotton and just starts stapling the cotton to the cow. Blood gushing out, the cow's howling in agony. But it's a sheep now, right? I use this analogy on purpose. I know it's horrific to think about it, and I intend no hurt to cows unless I'm eating them. But, actually, I don't really want to hurt them then either. But the point is, no attempt was made to disguise the fact that those cluffs of cotton have nothing to do with the episode. I, I, I don't know how to explain this. is one of those it-fits-in-my-head situations. Because if you just just watch the episode. Just watch the episode and it's like, alright, the Explorer and the, the, the Ares 4 and this mission and blah blah blah. And then Seven just kind of wanders into the picture. And all of a sudden, there's this tuft of cotton instead of a cow. You, you, get, you get the parallel here? Because the stuff with Seven is so blatant... So poorly written, so obvious in its overall construction, it literally feels like it was flung in at the last minute, which, based on what I understand, is actually true. Robert Beltran himself was actually surprised to get the final draft of the script, I, a.k.a. the draft he gets before he goes in and starts filming, and discovered, hey, it's not my episode anymore. That's how late in the game these changes were finalized. And it shows... Is this suddenly Seven from three years ago? This is season six. She joined in season three. Do the math. <laughs> Think about it for a moment. She literally acts like she has no concept or understanding of um, sentimentality. I, I, I lost the word for a second there. Of sentimentality. Because that is actually what a lot of the episode's about. How sentimental we can be as people. Not just humans, but a alien races in general. How we can put value on something that has no value. Let me give you an example real quick, okay? I'm serious. This is Void Yoshi. I'm sure some of you have seen him before. Now, Void Yoshi here... This is actually a bad example, but I didn't want to show anything that's actually valuable to me. So, Void Yoshi here uh, is, well, like ten bucks... Easily replaceable doesn't mean I, I could just I'm not going to do it, but I could just toss them away. It doesn't mean a damn thing as far as literal value. But this has sentimental value. I affix value to this because I choose to. And, for, and there's so many different reasons why you can choose to affix sentimental value to something. But it is an intangible thing. And that's the whole point of the episode, that intangible connection that we all share. It's actually kind of a great theme and a great message in very Star Trek. Seven has had this idea explained to her, her already. More than once. For God's sakes. How many episodes ago was this when she, when she talked about art? You remember that? The sculpting and the painting in Leonardo's workshop? Art is irrelevant. By the end of the episode, she understands there might be a purpose in the sentimentality of art. <sighs> I'm sorry, Yoshi. So, they just suddenly revert Seven's character. Three years might be an exaggeration, but it is two plus years at least. And she is suddenly acting like she's a fresh Borg who doesn't get why all these people are so excited about this. Literally saying lines like, history is irrelevant. And then, no, you know, this is this is something that aggravates me in television and has for years. I, I, I don't actually see this that often nowadays in television. Uh, television as a medium, as, as a product of, of entertainment, has moved forward in the last decade and a half. It's been since I've really seriously watched television. But one of the things that used to really piss me off in TV is, let's imagine this is the episode, okay? And you spend this much of the episode, this huge bulk, hammering in a point, okay? Doesn't matter what the point is. Bam, 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 bam. No subtlety. No nothing. Just hammer in the point, hammer in the point, hammer in the point. Oh, I was wrong! And that's the last bit of the episode. How many of you can name episodes of any show? Even humorous shows like cartoons or like Simpsons. Excuse me, not all cartoons are humorous, obviously. But how many of you can name an episode of any television show that has that formula? Point, point, you know, just absolutely hammering this point in over and over and over and over, and then this tiny last little bit. Oh, we've changed our mind. This is actually referred to as a pat ending, a pat TV ending. There's a term for that, and I'm not going to talk about that right now. So, Seven 
spends the first, uh, I wrote it down, uh, 31 minutes of the episode going, history is relevant, history is relevant, history is relevant, sentimentality is relevant, exploration is irrelevant, this is stupid, this is dumb, I hate you all. And then the last, well, the last two minutes of her actual screen time suddenly converted, just it's pat, and it's dumb, and I hate it. Moving on. Oh, you know what? I, I, <laughs> this is my second bullet point of this episode, right there. I really feel for Robert Beltran, too, because, as I've said so many times, Chakotay is an interesting character. Every time they have actually done something with him, I have liked it. I could say the same about Harry Kim, actually. And it's not like both actors don't have the skill and the motivation to do something with it. But no, we've got to have Seven on board. After all, she's got the uh, the assets necessary to bring in new viewers, right? We'll see more of this when we get to Enterprise, too. <sighs> Forgive me for my acerbicness, but God, really? You know what, if I could just... I, I don't want to discuss this, but I do feel the need to defend myself. Yes, Seven was portrayed as sexy. I don't actually personally find Jerry Ryan sexy, that's just my opinion. Um, but she was definitely portrayed as a uh, in a very sexy manner. That doesn't actually bother me, believe it or not. I still would have preferred if she did the slow transition from Borg to human. I think that would have been much better for her character arc. But the fact that there is sexy in Star Trek is old hat. Go watch the original series sometime. Go watch TNG. Go watch Deep Space Nine. Seriously. This is not new. It doesn't bother me. What bothers me is all those other series would also spend time on other characters. As much as they had the miniskirts and some rampant sexism back in the original series, they also had great character pieces and moments for people who were not the, the pretty women. They didn't just randomly have an episode about a pretty girl take place of an episode that was intended for Scotty or, Ch or McCoy or, or hell, <laughs> even Chekhov in one case. No, they actually had character time. And they did this in TNG as well, and they did this in Deep Space Nine as well. What bothers me here in Voyager, in this episode, is they took this sexy character and said she should be the primary focus because she's popular. And screw off the other character we were going to actually flesh out. A character in desperate need of being fleshed out, I might add. Why? You know? So that's the thrust of my complaint here. Please don't start one of those arguments on my channel. Uh, and then Seven randomly redoes the entire computer core without notifying anybody and without authorization. I, I have to admit, I, I do like that that's actually a bit of continuity. It shows that they actually trust Seven enough to allow her to basically kill everyone on the ship if, the, if she actually felt like it, because she has full unauthorized, or, or not unauthorized, uh, uh, unrestricted access to the computer core. Okay, I'm with it. Um, what really weirds me out is we hear a bunch of babble, including Neelix, I might add, and this is two in the morning. We know this because when Janeway comes up, she's like, she actually says flat out it's two in the morning, and Harry is the one in the bridge seat, which, you know, makes sense because he's the night, off uh, he's the night officer, he's the guy running the deck uh, overnight. So, first of all, I'm wondering what Chakotay was doing reading a book at two in the morning. Second of all, I'm wondering what all those other people on the thing... I mean, that seems like a lot of activity for two in the morning. But I know, little thing to, 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 to complain about. I have a note here, which I've basically already covered. I, I really feel like I've hammered this point in. It's called Seven... I, I'm just going to read my note here word for word. Seven learns a lesson... Uh... Monty Python reference. But seriously, I, I don't have anything else to say about it. It's dumb, stupid, moving on. What I do want to say is I like the natural enthusiasm from quite a bit of the crew. Uh, the Doctor has a good scene. Robert Picard has a good scene where he enthuses about what it was like to be a part of exploration. Good stuff. I like how uh, there's a scene where uh, basically everyone, really, but, you know, Torres, Janeway... Tom, and of course Chakotay, all just gush at the idea of exploring the total unknown, despite the dangers. I am reminded of a quote, which I actually love, and I am going to miss... I'm not going to quote directly, because I don't remember it word for word. 
I'm sure some of you have heard this quote before, and especially you Trek fans out there. <clears throat> uh, I, I almost want to look up the quote. You know, I'm going to look up the quote. I can look at it real quick. I'm super fast. Watch. Just, just time me. Time me, okay? Ah, uh, shoot. I misclicked. I'm nervous. No! I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Uh... Does it not have the quote listed here? Oh, I'm going to be so sad if it doesn't. It doesn't It doesn't have the quote listed. Oh my god, it's like the best quote of that whole episode. You got to be kidding me. It doesn't have it listed. If you can't take a little bloody nose, maybe you ought to go back home and crawl into your bed. It's not safe out here. It's wondrous with treasures to satiate desires both subtle and gross. But it is not for the timid. That quote really resonated with me. In this episode and in Star Trek in general, the idea that exploration and the idea of Star Trek in general, of being out there, of being a part of the frontier, space, this kind of a science fiction culture, is inherently dangerous. But it is also worth it. A negative and a positive at the same time, if you will. And I like that idea. And I got that very strong impression from the crew. That quote actually ran through my head a couple of times while I was watching this episode, which is why I wanted to share it with you. <clears throat> but then the episode kind of falls flat. For example, why does Chakotay get stupidly obsessed with, with recovering the module? Now, I know what you're saying. What? Well, they might have lost it forever. That is true. They might have lost it forever. Do keep in mind the threat that was facing them at the time was a temporary, short-term, not-happening-forever threat. They could have gotten out, waiting for them, to, waiting for the thing to hit the, the piece of dark, excuse me, dark matter, which we're not even going to discuss how they, they view dark matter in this episode, and then they could have gone back in and gotten it and gotten out. Or maybe they couldn't. It is entirely possible that they couldn't have gone back in and got out. But as the commander, don't you think it would have been a little bit more sensical to go for the, you know, okay, we'll head out and hope for the best plan rather than the, we're going to get it right now and make it now plan. He actually is stupidly obsessed about this. It's actually funny because the delays, and, and, and I actually <laughs> tracked this, seriously. They, they have a ratio of about four seconds. If they had been four seconds quicker, they would have been fine. Count how long Tom and Seven delay in answering his orders. Because he has to... And he doesn't try to explain himself, of course. He just says, do it! That's an order! That's an order! Do it! Why this sudden fixation on the now? There is no urgency in the now. Remember, it's not going into another dimension in the now. <sighs> then, Seven gets so angry at Dakota. It actually feels like it was dialed up a bit much. Like, her anger at him is understandable, don't mistake me. I actually agree with her. I would be angry at him, too. But her anger at him is basically just cranked up, as if the director just said, I want you to imagine he just told you a, a really terrible your mother joke. And she's just like, ah! And she just rails into him constantly about that. Of course, I think we all know what's actually happening here. This is clearly... Clearly Voyager writer's idea of trying to write romantic tension. Because after all, there's so much foreshadowing and so much buildup for this great and grand relationship that Chakotay and Seven are going to have in the last episode of the entire series. And there's also the fake one, but that doesn't count. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this was clearly them trying to lead up to it. After all, they have so much experience in writing these things. Uh, they, you know, because this is exactly how uh, Tom and Bolana got together, right? Constantly being vitriolic towards each other with absolutely not even a single spark of chemistry. One really nice point. There's a scene where uh, Kelly, the camp, this is, as much as I've complained about this episode, I think it's time to go ahead and gush. Because like I said, there's about a nine-minute chunk of this episode that I adore. And it's all the stuff with Kelly, uh, the gentleman played by uh, Phil Morris. There's a line, uh, just really quick, before I get into his stuff, there's a line where he's talking about, I can't blame this one on pilot error. The camera happens to be on Tom when that happens. And McNeil uh, actually 
visibly and noticeably flinches just mm, when he hears about that pilot error. That was a really nice touch. For those of you who've forgotten, of course, Tom Paris and his pilot error is basically what ruined his life and led to him going to the New Zealand uh, penal colony in both his original incarnation and the one they rewrote for Voyager. So, nice touch there. But Kelly's discussions, the talks about baseball, his analysis of what he's been doing in there, I cannot put into words. I, I, I hate to say this, because this is going to be the shortest part of my episode, even though it's the part I want to talk about the most. But there's so little to talk about. He nails his performance. Absolutely nails it. There is a simple, flat humanity to his performance. He seems like a guy. It takes a great deal in order to take something that for us, the viewers watching this episode, is so old that it's been something since the first episode of the original series. Space travel and aliens. These are two extremely old topics, okay? We're used to that. That's the norm. That's the mundane. It takes something special, some great writing, and some great acting and some great directing to actually portray the mundane as amazing. To portray the normal and the ordinary as spectacular. As something worth it. He has this line, which is what I wanted to remind myself, and I already forgot it. We were right to come out here. That is a great line. That really helps emphasize what I talked about earlier. That whole <sighs> intangible... In sentimentality, the desire to explore, the enjoyment of the moment, the fact that the factual matter doesn't change anything. You know, that data is certainly factual and will change things. That's the hard, that's the mundane. But the essence, the feeling of accomplishment, of seeing an alien ship, the simple, it's not even wonder. He's not like, oh. there's just this sort of I would almost call it relief in his voice. We were right to come out here. There is life other than us. There is something other than us. There's so much more. The way he says it, the whole scene where he's dictating his logs is pure gold. It was worth enduring the first 33 minutes of this episode just for the few minutes of John Kelly and his amazing, Phil, Phil Morphs' amazing, amazing performance. I cannot gush about it enough. And I am not ashamed to admit it actually brought me to tears a couple of times as he lays there, die, sits there, dying. And he says he's going to, t he's going to shut off life support because he knows it's over. And he's going to divert everything to the scanners to try and grab every last ounce of data he can. I like that. I could only pray that I meet my end with half as much dignity as that. Of course, I plan to live forever, but that's unrelated. So, one final point. I know this is going to sound weird. I get the connection to space and why they shoot him out to space. He was out there to explore it and, and connect with it, blah, blah. I get the speech, blah, blah, blah. Maybe I just think in a different direction than they do. But I wouldn't have shot him out into space. I would have kept him in stasis. I would have set aside a part of the ship for him, for his capsule, for, for a stasis pod or a torpedo pod or something. Put him in stasis so he could be preserved. It's not that hard. We have this tech on Voyager. They once whipped up enough for the entire crew when they went to cross a nebula in one. You remember that? So get one of these... Set its, give it its own independent power supply. It's just one stasis pod. Don't tell me you can't do that. Take him home. Take that poor man back to Earth. So he could at least rest there. Because I'm a sentimental bastard, too. I'll see you next time, guys.